We all know that in the world of modern media, uh, labels are a little bit fluid, but um, it's meant that their dynamic can develop. It means that now podcast is front and center in New York City, and he just happens to be there in the summer when all hell is about to break loose. Gil, the Ghostbusters are back, and yes. I love it. And uh, Frozen Empire is so much fun. This actually reminded me much more of the original films because we're back in New York under a big attack. Um, and it's been three years since uh, Ghostbusters made their return to the big screen uh, in Afterlife, which continued the story of the original Ghostbusters. How do how does this film serve uh, longtime fans, but also a great entry point for new fans? Well, I think that uh, we knew with Afterlife that it was a rekindling. It was uh, leaving the home of Ghostbusters in order to find a way to refocus the story on the young Spangler family. At the center of it, Phoebe Spangler, who makes a discovery about her extraordinary lineage that led us back to this place, to New York City, where we could finally have the celebration of ghost busting that I have, as a fan, have been waiting for 40 years for. So okay. you, what you need to know is absolutely nothing, just to know that there are ghosts in this world and there was an outfit that was started in 1984 that tried to do the city a deed by trapping those ghosts, putting them away so you could go on with your life. And in the couple of years since the Spanglers have returned to the city, it's sort of been status quo, but now, extraordinarily, things are about to take a turn into a much more menacing direction, and the Ghostbusters are gonna encounter a threat the likes of which they have never seen before, and it's gonna take every single one of them to stand a chance to survive this story. Well said. Now, I love that the original Ghostbusters is about four ordinary guys that saved New York twice over. This film focuses around an ordinary family mm. that, that is uh, saving New York as well. How do you take some of the themes from the franchise and then make them your own? The thing that has made Ghostbusters so enduring is exactly what you just said, the fact that these are not superheroes. These are sure. folks like you and I, who just happen to be brilliant in the direction of supernatural science and figure out through Egon's genius that there is a way to harness some of those energies and to, and to trap them. But that's what makes it so relatable is that is that we're relying on a group of ordinary people that essentially form the last line between us as citizens of this world surviving or perishing forever. So the 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 way to make it sort of enduring and relatable is is by holding on to that essential grounding of the the reality of these characters. And as long as uh, my my di directorial compass is pointed in a in a direction of authenticity when it comes to the human stories that we're telling, uh, and that we look to the human obstacles, the interpersonal obstacles, as a catalyst for the extraordinary supernatural obstacles that we are presenting in the character's path, that is the sort of uh, DNA of a thrilling, exciting Ghostbusters story. You co-wrote this film with Jason Reitman, just like you did on Afterlife. Uh, what were some of the themes you connected with uh, in this overall story? And what was where was the starting point for you guys that you knew you wanted to go back to New York and bust more ghosts instead of taking, you know, uh, staying in Oklahoma? The Spangler family, when uh, when they arrive in Somerville, Oklahoma, in, in the first film, in, in the last film, sorry, in Afterlife, they're a family that is unmoored, right? They're sort of looking for a, uh, looking for a home, essentially. And they think they're gonna find it maybe in this rambling old farmhouse. What they discover is not a home, but a thread that leads them to this extraordinary discovery about their own lineage, their legacy. And for Phoebe gives an entire purpose to her life. But they end that story no closer to a home than they started. Right. And what this film gave us the opportunity to do and what we started to do in the writing of, of this story was to suggest that through this discovery of their ghost busting connection, they finally have a chance at something resembling a home. Although it's not a normal, you know, sh there's no uh, white picket fence, there's no lawn, we're talking about a firehouse in, in, in Tribeca, but still, it's a place to feel closer to the family that they never really knew. Uh, a, a way to feel like they've got a place to live and a place to be a family. Now, what was exciting about that is that we can then, through circumstance and through storytelling, threaten that. 
And so yes. we knew from the beginning that if we can create the idea of this family feeling a sense that maybe this is a path to them feeling together, then when our evil threat begins to get closer and closer, we're going to be able to draw a line in the sand and say, what are you willing to do? How brave are you willing to be in order to defend that home? And that's Absolutely. what this story is about. I love that theme of, of coming to and finding a home and also the iconic firehouse is back, which you mentioned. Uh, I love seeing the Ghostbusters firehouse. I remember having that place at when I was a kid. Um, now this time around, this is actually a place that they can call home, but they're living at the firehouse, but also they're working at the firehouse. So can you talk about how uh, living at the firehouse and balancing their work life and family life kind of affect the Spanglers? in the firehouse? We all struggle with the life-work balance, right? This is not, uh, it's not extraordinary to Ghostbusters. It's a little harder when you're a family that busts together. But uh, but one of the things that that gave us an opportunity to do is to also mine some of the unexplored resentment that Phoebe might have about the fact that this thing that she has a unique window into has been sort of embraced fully by everyone else around her. And that has added a sort of second front to some of the uh, schisms that uh, are, are beginning to bubble under the surface here in this story. But, but, you know, it's not every home that has a fire pole leading down from the bedrooms to the kitchen. It's not every home where you get to park the family car, which just happens to be Ecto-1 on the ground floor, you know, where normally you would have a living room and a television set. And that creates a really unique opportunity for these characters to both have to interact with the uh, relics of their past, uh, the ans their ancestors past in, in, in the form of Egon Spengler and his role in being one of the original Ghostbusters, uh, and also for the um, the new Spangler family to have to figure out how to relate to each other, how to survive a, as a family who just happens to be Ghostbusters. This film does a great job of blending the comedy, action, and horror into the film. Uh, both as a director and a co-writer, how do you balance the elements of comedy, action, and horror to create a cohesive film? I had the extraordinary experience of, of watching the first Ghostbusters film as a young kid in a movie theater. My dad took me to to see it and it really like rocked my world. I mean, it scared me. I laughed out loud and I didn't understand all the jokes, but I knew they were funny. <laughs> and I was totally mesmerized by that special tone. I mean, it, there was nothing else like it before, right? I mean, Ghostbusters right. was an, a, a unique film in the pop culture landscape because of its blending of those tones. So I was able to sort of channel, and, and Jason and I talk about this all the time when we're writing and when we're crafting these stories, holding on to the experiences that we had as young audiences watching the, those first films. And obviously Jason and I had very different relationships to those films. I was, a, I was a dork from the San Fernando Valley watching the movies and Jason's was on set while his dad was directing them. But still, we both have been able to hold on to that or experience. And that is something that we use as a uh, as, a, as a kind of superstructure to help uh, build these new stories on. Um, and when you're writing, it's an instinct thing. You know, you know, we knew that we wanted this story to be scarier. We knew that the stakes were going to get much more visceral and more more terrifying um, because as you build up the stakes you also build up the humor it just sort of they go hand in hand because once the tone starts the needle starts to move in one direction it naturally wants to swing in the other now given the iconic status of ghostbusters how do you approach introducing new characters like kamel nanjani's nadine uh, while playing homage to the original series i think the first way you do it is by finding the best and brightest of our comic actors. Ghostbusters has always had a really high bar in terms of performance and comic performance especially. So we knew that Kumail was going to be a character in the story before we started writing the script and uh, in fact began a series of conversations with Kumail early in our development process just to start to test the waters to explore some directions and, and, and uh, opportunities about this uh, idea of a character who uh, inadvertently 
unleashes one of the most, you know, horrifying uh, creatures that this film series has ever known. Uh, and uh, so the answer to the question is by aiming really high in terms of talent uh, and knowing that if we do our job as writers, if I do my job as filmmaker, that it's going to allow a character to come to the screen that's going to hold their own with the greats of this series. Now, Kamel is new to the Ghostbusters franchise. What does he add to the group dynamic in Frozen Empire? Kamel brings a sort of a, an outsider's POV because he comes into this with a healthy, grounded skepticism. He's pragmatic. He's trying to make a buck <laughs> and wants to get on with his life. He is not looking for an adventure. He's not looking for a seat at the table of the end of the world. Uh, but because he happens to be in the crosshairs of this narrative, it means that he, as a totally unsuspecting citizen of this city, is going to play a frontline role in helping to save this world. Now, Phoebe has a real sense of belonging, now finding her calling being a real Ghostbuster. What happens when all that's taken away from her? The stakes could not be higher for Phoebe because uh, she feels like the experiences in Somerville were, for her, a light shining into the path of the future. She finally started to feel like she was not a jigsaw piece that couldn't fit into the puzzle uh, it, she she felt like there was a fit for her and a path that she could lean into that could help define her unique um uh, uh capabilities and sensitivities uh and watching that threatened to be taken away from her um both because of uh, the uh, events of the initial ghost busting sequences that go slightly awry and then because of the extraordinary scope of her own adventure in this story uh, that for her creates deep personal and narrative stakes um, and you just see in Phoebe a, a yearning a passion to do right by her grandfather um, and to live up to the highest standard of what a Ghostbuster can be. Uh, and that makes this adventure so much more thrilling because you know how much she can stand to lose. Without going into spoiler territory here, Phoebe makes a new friend in this film, Melody. What can you tell me about uh, their relationship? What can you tease about their relationship? We've never had a character in these stories that is a ghost with a new story to tell. Ghosts, right. these stories have always been uh, the thing that you point your wand at. Uh, and and with Melody, we have the, for the first time, a character that has a, uh, a voice and a story to tell. Uh, and for Phoebe, um, who is searching for her place in her family, is searching for her role as a Ghostbuster because that is on rocky ground. There is this, you know, really poignant um, uh, irony that the one person who she seemingly connects with happens to be the sort of person that she, uh, by, uh, by lineage, by instinct, by ability, should be uh, should be pointing her, her proton wand at, and right. that creates a real a real fertile ground for 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 drama and character, um, and uh, part of what makes the, the the sort of central beating heart of this story. Now, as Trevor enters adulthood, has he fully embraced being a Ghostbuster with the rest of his family? Yeah, first of all, Trevor is going to be the first one to tell you that he's an adult. He'll he will say it every day, <laughs> every moment. He's very excited about his cusping adulthood. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think for, for Trevor, uh, the access point is different from Phoebe, right? For Phoebe, it's a sort of deep intellectual process. For Trevor, it's more instinctual. He's he's a seat of the uh, uh, you know uh, seat of the pants kind of operator, but he is uh, he does have the same hallmark that all great Ghostbusters have, which is a fearlessness. 
And yes. uh, that is actually something that marks him. I believe Trevor would lay his life on the line for any other character in this story. And I think that does make him a true blue Ghostbuster. As a stepfather myself, I completely relate to Paul Rudd's Gary. Uh, there's a fine line between being uh, their kid's best friend and an authority figure. Can you talk about Gary's struggle to balance the relationship with the kids? Absolutely, thank you for saying that. And uh, it's, it's an arc that Jason and I were very, very, um, very excited to tell in this story and wanted to make sure that we got just right because it is emotionally loaded territory, but it also is a story that felt so human, yes. so true to the dynamic of this uh, blended family that are, that is coming together. And again, their, their, their main goal is to find a way to coexist as Ghostbusters and people who all, all care about each other. Um, but for Gary, there is a, a sense of trying to find his way in from, from, from the outside and just feeling like he truly has his his home too. It's the it's the it's the same uh, theme writ large, but on a more personal level. Um, and and I I will say that even though it's a story specifically about a a stepfather who is is making his bond with this family, any parent will relate to that to that moment where you have to make a decision about am I going to be the friend or am I going to be the uh, the, 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 the parent? Am I going to lay down the law, even though it's gonna mean some short-term loss of uh, coolness and, and, uh, and, 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 and it might seem to threaten our bond? But the truth is that anybody who's parented in any version of parenting will know that it's actually the way to create a more sustainable, long-term, healthier relationship. Can you talk about Ray and podcast's relationship and how it's evolved in this film? I love their relationship together. Me too. Well, you saw at the end of Afterlife that there was a quick and unexpected chemistry between those two characters. They both are open to the wonders of the universe. They're both true believers uh, in whatever shape that comes. Uh, and we just had to find a way to develop that story so that their conversation continued from that first meaningful meetup in the fields of Somerville. Uh, and so uh, Ray, who probably through podcasts urging has now started his own show, Repossessed, that is a kind of streaming uh, uh, platform show uh, about him uh, 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 analyzing uh, potentially haunted objects it's allowed podcasts to come into the fold of Ray's occult books as a producer slash intern. We all know that in the world of modern media, uh, labels are a little bit fluid, but um, it's meant that their dynamic can develop. It means that now podcast is front and center in New York City, and he just happens to be there in the summer when all hell is about to break loose. Now, Winston has been hard at work since the last time we saw him. What has he been up to? And uh, can you talk about some of the new tech we see in Ghostbusters Frozen Empire? Yeah, I mean, Winston has never forgotten how Ghostbusters was there for him when he was looking for a steady paycheck and gave him so much more. I mean, it gave him an identity and gave him a family uh, in Egon and Peter Venkman and, and Ray Stans. And now that he's sort of come into some success, some great success he has reinvested in that operation that for him was so important in his own development as a as a man um, so he has um, in uh, doubled down on the promise of ghost busting into the future by developing a sort of skunk works operation the paranormal research center where he has started to employ a new generation of brilliant young minds who are tinkering with the exploration and academic study of the of the paranormal of the supernatural and that creates great opportunity 
and also opens the door to some pretty dangerous uh, avenues, and we explore both in this story. James Acaster is also a new member of the team this time around as Lars. Uh, what can you tell us about Lars, and what did James bring to the role that wasn't on the page? Jason and I have been fans of James's for a long time. Uh, we both saw him do stand-up years ago. Um, I worked with James on my last film, A Boy Called Christmas. He was he did some comedy writing on that film, and I completely love that project. Process. I, I, I just saw a brilliant comic mind at work. He's sharp and dry as sandpaper, and uh, and and has a very um, unique comic sensibility. Um, and he brought so much. I mean, the most reverent lines. You know, the the, the grandfather clock. Uh, that holds the spirit of an actual grandfather. Those are classic James-isms that he would just sort of spill out on set. But for me, the thing that excites me most about his performance is that he, this is his first film, first time on camera, um, oh. and he took so naturally to inhabiting a character and not just being a, a funny guy who's being funny in the film, but really understood that there was a, a role for his character to play in this larger story. Uh, and I love that this is James's first movie because he's, he's obviously going to go very far. Well, Gil, thank you so much for your time. I love Ghostbusters Frozen Empire. It's a sense of nostalgia that I remember watching when I was a kid, but completely fresh and new. Thank you so much, man. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Joe. What a what a great chat, and I really appreciate you. Have a great day. 